Thank you for taking time being with us today. Tell us a little bit more regarding your background and how did you get into real estate? Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Um, sure. So I started, uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. My father owned restaurants. My mother owned a catering service. So I thought I would just follow in those footsteps and I'm having dinner with my father by himself, which is a rare occasion one night. And he says, you know, get out of this business. I'm about 20, about 21, 22 years old. And, you know, I, I'm bartending and I'm just, you know, think that's what my career path is going to be. And he says, get out of this business and get in a profession. So I thought, gee, not a bad idea. So I checked into going to law school. I went to law school like five minutes later. I mean, literally I finished my last year of college <laughs> and, and the following, and I was enrolled in law school the following, the following fall, which sure. was a plan that if I didn't do it then I would never yeah. do it. Sure. Um, part of it, part of the motivation was I was, like I said, I was early twenties and I was bartending with guys who were, you know, late twenties, early thirties going like a professional athlete career. Like I don't want to be there, their age doing this. Right. So went to law school. Um, didn't, you know, my parents were entrepreneurs, but they never stressed entrepreneurialism at home. They just own businesses. They own their business and they, that was their life. And that's you know, where they are living. And so, uh, when I'm in law school, I'm thinking I'm just going to follow the same path, go work for a big firm, you know, become a partner and everything's going to be all fine and good. Uh, that lasted about two years into being a lawyer. And I realized that this is something that I didn't want to, the career path of being a, of striving to be a partner was full of infighting and all this other stuff. So my wife and I formed our own law practice. My wife was an attorney, which I met at my first job. Um, so we formed our own debt collection law practice in 1990, which we had till 2008. And so when I got into, we closed the practice in 2008, I was in, started investing. I, st I opened up a company buying judgment liens in California, executing on real property. So now I'm starting to get into real estate a little bit and still doing debt collection, which is what my core strength is. And then in 2013, I got exposed to notes, which just became a different debt instrument that was a nice segue. I've told people that I've been in debt all my life, but not personally. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been on the other side of the debt. Exactly. So getting involved, investing in notes was just something um, that just was a natural big one. And That's uh, how I got into real estate. And for people that are not uh, very familiar with notes, can you run us through the process and how, how do you get the deal flow? How does it work for you regarding returns? Just, just an overview or regarding how that works. Certainly. So what we do is we buy the defaulted distressed mortgages from banks and hedge funds. So first off, we're cultivating the relationship with banks and hedge funds where the deals come to us. We're not sending out the yellow letters or, or the bandit signs and trying to hunt for stuff. The deals come to us through our relationship building. Um, and then what, what, since we're buying the discounted, the, the defaulted note mortgage, uh, mostly in the Midwest and the South, uh, we are then we're buying them at, say, 40 cents on the dollar. We're buying occupied assets because I want to keep our core strength is I want to keep the borrower in the home. So then we go out and we talk, communicate with the borrower in a manner which is a lot different than the banks, um, giving them a little professional you know, respect and dignity. And we just work out loan modifications and other uh, exit strategies that keep them in their home. And, but how, how do you... How do you assess that this is a good deal? And because the other guys are already getting want want to get rid of it, you are buying it at the discount, and we understand it because I don't want it. So here, if you want it, you can buy it uh, cheaper. But how do you assess that that's a good deal, and you can turn it around and have cash flow positive for your investors? Good question. Um, first off, the reason they're being sold is these banks and hedge funds are selling them off as a commodity. They've already written them off. They're, they're, they're not selling them because they're toxic. They're selling them because they just that's their, their game plan these days is just, just to be able to get rid of them as a commodity. So they're, they're sold, they're sold, they're sold. Now where we can make money is we're work, actually talking to the borrower and working through it instead of selling it as a commodity. So once that the merry-go-round stops of selling it as a commodity and you can work through it and add value, you will, you will increase your yields. But again, if I'm buying the, the asset at 40 cents on the dollar, for example, I'm buying a $50,000 house in Ohio for 20, the, where the value of the house is 50 grand. The note is probably underwater. It could be $80,000. And I'm buying it for $20,000. I communicate with the borrower and we're doing say a four or $500 modification payment. Okay, so then the returns there are about 20, 30%. And that's kind of how, what our bread and butter is. 
But how how you do how do you make sure that the deal will work? Because it sounds to me that there's a lot of negotiation with with each of the each of the owners of the of the property. It's not it's not kind of a it's not a, a, a kind of a volume business. It's a one by one business because you have to assess each one individually. Probably you have to assess their capability to keep going with the mortgage. With the mortgage, can you run us through this a little bit? Certainly. So in we've bought 100 notes in 2015. We bought 78 last year. And this year we're ramping up and we'll probably get close to 50 to 60 by the end of the year as it is. So in that respect, you are creating systems and, and procedures to be able to analyze this stuff in a pretty quick manner, right? So we're buying, say, on a monthly basis. And what we're doing is we're checking out every asset is different and unique. You're correct. Correct. But what we're doing is, is some of the basic core principles are all the same. You've got to make sure that your values are what they are. So we're running uh, our local uh, MLS type data internally to my partners or brokers. So we've got access to that. Um, we're getting a local realtor engaged who gave us the flavor of the neighborhood, just like you're buying anything else. We are running title to make sure we have clean title. There's no liens or judges. And if there are, we'll just know how to, we need to deal with them later. We're checking taxes to make sure that the taxes aren't, we have properties not lost to delinquent taxes. Um, and we're checking, which is key to us, again, is occupancy. We want to buy notes that the borrowers, that the somebody still lives there. So we're running, we're sending out our property preservation people to go out and door knock and make sure that the properties, are, the, the owners, there's somebody still living in the property. So, and then a few other, you know, diligence type factors. But for the most part, as you're focused on those core issues, You've analyzed it, say, okay, if the values check out and everything else is clean and you're getting the value is 40 cents on the dollar, how can you go wrong? Now, if the borrower won't get out of their own way and I've got to foreclose, I know what, what it'll cost me to foreclose. I know what I'll do is turn around and put another borrower in there and do seller financing. But how do you, the, the problem that I have with this is, how do you assess that someone is actually going to pay you when you, when you take over the property? Because there's also sorts of people, there are people that are willingly not uh, going to pay, but there are people that are actually going to pay because they have run into some issues, but they are serious people. So how do you assess this? Okay, remember, I've got a debt collection background. So when you set up the right process and procedure, right? So first of all, I use a third party. A lot of times I use a third party credit counselor to talk to my borrowers. So right now, right out of the gate, you've got somebody talking to a borrower saying, let me help you talk to your lender. When I get on the phone with a borrower, it's how can I help you? And that usually emanates into about 30 seconds of silence where there's fear, fear and apprehension, then they vomit their country western song on me. And then in that, in, in that communication, it's, I will gladly pay you $400 a month. And when I bought that note for $10,000, you easily say, sure, I'll do that. And my default rate is less than 10%. But mm -hmm. the answer to your question, it's, I can't predict who will pay and who will not. But here's the thing, when you set up your systems, for example, once the credit counselor who gets engaged right away, if there's not making any communication with the borrower, I will have to refer to my foreclosure attorney. And then as a debt collection mentality, it's if you're getting foreclosed on, but you have an opportunity, bad cop, if an opportunity to talk to the credit counselor, good cop, you're going to come around. Borrowers come around, either their circumstance changed when I bought the loan or the circumstance changed while I own the loan. I've done deals where the borrower paid me off you know, on the eve of a foreclosure sale because it came into some money, right? It's, it's just, it's, some of it's timing, but some of it is just run your system, run your process, and everything will work out. The only people I foreclose on and actually take their house are borrowers that just can't get out of their own way. I give everybody the opportunity to stay in their home. Okay. And regarding, regarding returns from an investor perspective, if, if that's okay, can, can you... On average, what's the type of return that you can that you can get from all those all the business that you have uh, currently on year on year basis? So, our model is set up where, without guaranteeing anything, sure, I just just we, a ballpark. Yeah, we, we have goals that that we deliver twelve percent or more returns to our to our investors. But here's the thing: when I'm investing in, there's two different buckets. When I'm investing in, say, the lower value. Assets, assets worth around $50,000, you will achieve higher numerical returns. My son always characterizes it as, do you want three quarters of a grape or one quarter of a watermelon? Sure. Meaning, meaning you're getting, 
in a lower balance stuff, I'm getting a $300 payment, but it may be a 25% return. If I'm buying an asset that's say, we're 75 to $200,000, I may be getting a 900 to $1,000 payment, but I may have paid 60, $70,000 for that asset. So my numerical return may only be 15, 16%. And that's before profit splits. And regarding, regarding tax efficiency, how does the, the tax, uh, taxes work regarding notes? Uh, is it different from, from uh, owning a property? What's the tax bracket from the business that you do? Um, are you talking about the tax? Uh, yeah, because you're, you, you're dealing with notes, right? So is there a tax difference between that and the return that you get from all, all different investments? Yes, yes and no. First of all, I would say that everyone needs to consult their own tax professional because sure. everyone's in their own tax situation. But in a in general sense, your loan modification payments, your rental payments, et cetera, are, in, well, your loan modification payments are uh, interest income. If I turn and actually exit out of an asset, say fix and flip, it's just, it's capital gains, yep. generically speaking. But again, everybody needs to consult their own tax professional. And re regarding your business, since you obviously have this, uh, many of the sounds that you have this, this covered, where do you see the, the future of your company heading? Um, good question. Um, it, will, it will maintain with the opportunities of being, by, you know, you don't know how long the run will last. Actually, you do. For example, pricing of notes have got, has gone up a little bit, mostly not because appreciation of properties, et cetera. It's just, there's just a lot of people in the marketplace that are overpaying for assets and sellers that are, that are allowing it to happen. Um, so we're seeing pricing, you know, we've got to sharpen our pencil and do, and, and be really, you know, more concerned on our bottom line. And, and part of that is, which is kind of difficult for me is, okay, so as a debt collector, like I said, if I'm having a conversation where you're, you know, going to get vomit your country Western song on me, but you can offer me $400, as a debt collector, you're like, okay, get cash flow generating. That's great. That's all I want to do. In, in the easy sense, if I know what I bought it for, I know what my cost basis is on the tip of my fingers, and know I'm generating that that offer to me is 20% or more, I'm easily going to take it. Now, as we started buying the higher value assets and paying a little more for them, we model out what payment modification type payment we need to generate the returns that we need for, for what we desire for our, our, our investors. So now if I'm talking to you and I've modeled it out where I need a $600 a month payment and you're offering me $300, I've got to force you, encourage you into why you're going to pay me $600 or I'm just, we're just not going to be able to make a deal because I can't take that $300 payment anymore because I had to, I had to pay too much for, for the asset. It's not that I had to pay because there's other extra strategies that will, I can still utilize that will still give me great returns. But if I'm going to mod you out, I've got to hit more of the numbers that we've already modeled versus a debt collection to generate cash flow. With regard to where the market is going, if there's another downturn in the economy, my notes will only become that much cheaper to buy, which would be fine with me. Um, because at, at, at this time, it at least looks like cap rates are getting a little bit compressed, so prices are going, going up. Do you, see, do you see some relationship regarding the, the business that you develop? First of all, yes, I do. And, I, and I'll tell you what I, what I, what I see, though, is um, if I've got advice to others, it's stay diverse. We are buying a lot of REOs. We've got some REO sources as well as node sources. And we're finding out that we can buy the REOs at the same kind of returns, prospective returns, and, and discounts that we're getting the notes for. And while we're still staying within our core strength, because when we're buying REOs, we are rehabbing it to a little bit and then selling, selling them off with seller financing. So I'm still so instead of buying the discounted note and, and working it out sure. and, and rehabilitating that note, I'm now creating the note. I'm still creating the same cash flow. I'm still in the note business. I'm not a real estate guy, got into this business as a fix and flipper or wholesaler. That's not what I know. It's not what I do. I'm still a cash flow guy generating either generating a note or fixing a note okay regarding regarding books because i'm a bookworm and i always like to share books with people just changing the this a little bit tell us regarding some of the lat latest books that you've been reading that you like to, our listeners to to know you know i i work hard and i, I i'm a workaholic i love because i love what i do um, so when I read, I'm reading on an airplane, I'm reading on a vacation. I'm not reading at home because I just can't get around to doing it. Sure. So when I'm reading, um, I'm reading inspirational type stuff. My most favorite books are, um, three feet from gold written by Greg Reed, who's actually a personal friend of mine. Um, that's a 
story of, of a the three feet from gold story in of itself is there was a miner um, years ago that didn't know what he was doing mining and he struck it rich real quick and he goes back to back east and gets all his friends and and and, and family to invest in equipment so he can go go you know re, you know dig for some more gold but he doesn't know what he's doing so he's he's digging horizontal instead of vertical because that's what you do for gold and he's getting impatient and he's getting frustrated so a junk man comes up and says and he just says look you know what i'm tired of this i'm give you my equipment for $1.95 and he does. And the guy, the junk guy knows how to mine gold and mines it vertically and three feet from where he was, the guy hit the, struck, the, the largest strike in, in, in uh, San Francisco. Now, the guy who, who, I forget his name, the guy who uh, gave up became a, a millionaire doing insurance. But you know, again, he, he was three feet from his, his goal and he just didn't know what he was doing. Now the book itself is about Greg interviewing you know, successful people, what their failures were, you know, the guys from like Remax and Ugg Boots and, and, and Make-A-Wish and, and Vander Holyfield, et cetera, as to, you know, what kept you going in the, in the throes of you're about ready to give up and lose everything, what kept you going? So that was very inspirational. And I actually, Greg signed the book uh, at one of the first seminars I ever went to with my mentor, Scott Carson, um, when I got involved in notes. Um, there's another book out there, Life and Air, um, which is a good read. But other than that, it's just reading just for pleasure. Um, you know, I'm not a, a guy who, who, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a shoot ready aim kind of guy. I, I'm a, I'm a, you know, uh, repetition kind of guy. So I build my, my business, I build my process, my systems and just keep at it, wash, rinse and repeat. So I'm really not looking at books going, how can I do it bigger, better, brighter? But I, learn that information just by networking. I, I, you know, I speak nationally. I have opportunities to do podcasts like this, things and things of that nature. And just staying within the small world that we live in, you know, you, you, you gain, you, you figure out how to do things bigger, better, brighter, faster if you need to. Yeah. If you were to, to go back, uh, tell us regarding some of the, some of the worst mistakes that you did in business that you're not going to, to do them again. Um, choose your partners. If you're your business partners, very, very carefully. Make sure that your your partners compliment your provide a compliment to your skill set. That you're not doing the same thing that they are. They can do your weaknesses better than you can. Um, and make sure that they're in it, in it for the long term. Sometimes you start out in a new business and you're both just grinding away, but you find out that as you grow, that sometimes the business gets away from from one from one of you. Just out, you just out, he outgrows you. Uh, my father, you know, I, I knew growing up that you know he, some of the restaurants that he owned that he ended up buying out his partners never understood why that partnership didn't last but again it's probably same principles where you're compatible on day one but day 365 or day 750 you're just maybe not you know things have changed your business has grown or didn't grow or or your interest changed or what have you so choose your business partners very very carefully that's the first thing i would i would i would i would do go ahead Finally, where can our listeners get a hold of you and get in contact if they have any further questions or would like to know more regarding your business? Sure. Um, I encourage you to visit our website at www.azpcapital. That's adamzebrapaulcapital.com. Um, my personal cell number is, is area code 714-458-6317. And yes, I answer my phone. I'm a, I'm a guy who loves to talk. So, well, you know, I, I will pick up my phone and if I can help anybody in this business and, and assist their, them in their, in their investing career, I'm more than happy to do so. Yeah, it was wonderful having you with us today. Uh, hope to speak with you soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My okay. pleasure.